uh, of, there we go. Um, so uh, yeah, I, uh, I went to Fordham Law School once upon a time, similar to Paige. I was the president of Fordham Sports Law Forum. Um, much like you guys, I would sign up to go to all the different speakers events. We had our own um, symposium. Uh, we, I competed in two lanes baseball arbitration competition, anything I could get my hands on, uh, sports law related. Uh, I worked for the New York Giants for five years, uh, two before, uh, three before law school, and then two during law school. Um, and then, uh, you know, I just fell into this uh, kind of sports law uh, nexus. So um, uh, I guess Paige and I will get into more of my background, but uh, I will say before we start, it is an absolute pleasure to be on the other side of this. Uh, you know, I watched, I went to every symposium, uh, you know, I went to, I was in New York City, so I went to Columbia's, I went to NYU's, I wanted to see all the sports law symposiums. So it's very cool um, and my absolute, absolute, absolute pleasure uh, to be on the other end and, uh, and speaking to you guys and, and providing whatever uh, wisdom I can on my end. Thank you so much, Dan. We are so honored to have you and very excited to get into some current events and current legal issues surrounding sports today. And um, before we start, I, I just want to let everyone know that I'm going to go ahead and mute all. The way that we're going to structure this is do a little bit of a mediated talk between um, Dan and myself as the mediator, and then afterwards we'll leave time for Q&A. So at that point, I'll unmute everyone. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and press that button right now, and then Dan, of course, uh, please unmute yourself. <laughs> I'm all set. Perfect. So what I want to start off with today um, after, well, I guess uh, giving Dan a little bit of an intro in addition to his intro. Um, so Dan is an attorney at New York or at Goldberg Segala in New York, and he's a member of their sports law practice group. And he's also a published ABA writer for sports law. And he has a podcast called Conduct Detrimental, which talks about current events in sports. And it's very unique in the fact that it does have the intersection of law and sports, which um, individually I can say has been a difficult thing to find. Sports news is easy to find, but um, sports law is a little bit more difficult. So definitely encourage you guys to check that out because um, I've been listening to it and it's so helpful to keep up with current events and then also just um, sports law and help for my education in that area. And um, so as far as our first topic today, I want to go straight to boycott issues in sports right now. And I'm sure everyone's familiar, but just a little bit of a background on this issue. Um, started with the Milwaukee Bucks, which triggered boycotting across the NBA, WNBA, MLB, and the MLS, NHL, as well as professional tennis in um, a response to all of the police violence that's been occurring right now. And I think the first question I want to throw to you, Dan, is what do you think the justification in sports boycotts um, really entails? And then um, if it is justified, when would you say it is necessary from your legal expertise? When it's necessary to? From your legal expertise. Um, when is it necessary to um, create that stand in your opinion? And I, I kind of want to take it from there in your opinion. Um, it's definitely a great question, very timely, uh, number one. Uh, and I guess the only part of my background uh, that I didn't uh, fill in, um, you know, I, I am working uh, litigation. My goals before going to law school were to be a trial attorney or to do something in sports. Um, so for the first, uh, you know, five, five years of my practice, it was just focusing on litigation taking depositions, uh, writing motions, but uh, all the while, just like I would recommend that all of you do, staying on top of uh, sports issues and uh, stuff that interested me was the legal side of sports, which, you know, obviously you guys were all on board with. So um, about now, almost two years ago, I just, uh, you know, I had, um, and Paige mentioned, I had published a couple things in uh, the intersection of tech and law uh, for the American Bar Journal, uh, I mean, sorry, American Bar Association, New York Law Journal. Um, and then, you know, two years ago, I said, you know what, like, maybe I should just start uh, writing about sports and just directing my energy there. So that has led to a path uh, now, um, you know, and I uh, see a lot of familiar faces. I, you know, for, to, it's, a, it's like, sometimes it's just not, uh, it's crazy, but like, you know, I'll get a call from uh, different markets to talk about, you know, Nebraska's lawsuit, which I know we'll, we'll talk about, or even like the boycotts. Um, you know, there is a lot of questions that can't just uh, that sports fans want to know, but they need lawyers to explain it. So I empower all of you to do the same. It just starts by writing and 
you know, don't, don't assume that there is someone writing about a particular topic because as Paige said, there is not that much literature out there. Okay, so as for um, boycotts, the backdrop is obviously uh, the Milwaukee Bucks uh, and probably not coincidentally, uh, the events that occurred in Wisconsin um, and obviously the Milwaukee Brewers then following suit in baseball uh, and then all the dominoes fell across sports. So, um, you know, as uh, one of my favorite classes in law school was uh, labor law. I just thought that was really a uh, cool class. Shout out to my uh, professor Brudney, who is 100% not on the Zoom. Um, but, uh, you know, it, people kept saying that this was a boycott and you kept seeing, and I remember I saw a tweet from AOC and she goes, you know, why are, you know, why are they calling it boycotts? They should be calling it a strike. So just, you know, uh, with terminology, if you are having a strike, right, just in general, uh, you know, layman's terms, you're striking against your employer because you're demanding some action from your employer. But what was a very weird instance, and I can't imagine any, I haven't been able to find any version of this similar in sports. The athletes were not playing, but they weren't striking against their employer. They wanted to speak to the Wisconsin state legislator to, you know, get some uh, social justice action taken. So it wasn't technically a strike at that point because there was nothing being asked of the NBA. So within that next 24, 48 hours, um, it then became uh, what the proper term is called the wildcat strike. It's employees striking against their employer without um, explicit permission from the union. And why it became a strike is because now we've later learned players uh, had this big you know, all hands on deck meeting, 250 people, Michelle Roberts, the, uh, another former attorney uh, was, in the, was in this room. And basically they, um, you know, we're, never, we're probably not gonna hear about what was the entirety of the actions demanded. But one of them we know is that they wanted to use NBA, vacant NBA arenas for polling places during, uh, you know, during the upcoming election. Uh, and that was one of their demands directly to ownership. So you don't need 100 demands. One demand is sufficient to you know, constitute a particular strike. So um, yeah, in terms of legality, so you know, strikes are not allowed under an active CBA. You can't do that. There is uh, obvious ramifications for doing that, obviously loss of money, uh, potential cancellation of the entire CBA if you violate it. Um, so this was a very weird issue and you saw Adam Silver and, and commissioners across sports kind of walking on eggshells a little bit. So after the minutes, you know, the Milwaukee Bucks boycotted whatever you want to, however you want to phrase it at that point. Um, the, you'll notice that the Orlando Magic did not, um, they were on the court, they were ready to play the game. Uh, and there were reports that came out that the Orlando Magic were refusing to accept a forfeit. So there was kind of chaos, right? Like I'm, I, I played softball and all different sports in my career, intramurals and, and whatever else is going on. If you don't show up for a game, that's a forfeit. That's a loss. Um, but there is chaos that comes with that because that has never happened in any professional sport, uh, especially in the playoffs. So, um, you know, this is swift action from attorneys. Um, Adam Silver, and Michelle Roberts, both lawyers. Adam Silver, obviously the commissioner of the NBA. Michelle Roberts, the uh, head of the union. Two lawyers and just you know, people follow me. You know my thoughts on, on Rob Manfred. I do not think he could have got this done, but, um, you know, Adam Silver leading the charge within 48 hours and, and actually probably within, you know, two, three hours, he got ahead of these next slate of games, got together with Michelle Roberts and said, all of the next playoff games are postponed, we'll say until Friday, Saturday. But that avoided a messy situation where it gave the players an opportunity to either strike, boycott, um, and then throw everything in flux where there potentially might have been required action under the CBA. Um, so yeah, so Paige, to your particular question, uh, what we had here was a strike at some point, which is not allowed under the CPA. That was, uh, let's we'll say, illegal, violative of the, you know, the players' collectively bargained agreement. Um, but there was no action on the league's part because I think Adam Silver is very keyed into these social issues uh, and said, you know, why am I, uh, you know, uh, you bite your nose to spite your face? Why would I come down on this? Right? We have everything's been going great. The Emmys had no issues, no positive tests in the entire bubble. Um, but I think that's very creative lawyering, very creative problem solving on the fly. Uh, and, you know, uh, to your second point of your question, I think, uh, you know, it's more of a kind of pseudo political slash kind of legal question. But I think we all, all know that at, at this stage, right, you know, I'm not the most political person. I'm like, I'm, my sports are my politics. I don't really, I'm, I'm just kind of in the middle. Um, but sports are and politics are very much entwined, you know. Um, you can't really escape at this point. And that goes all the way from uh, the president being very much involved uh, in the Big Ten uh, conversation, which I know we're definitely going to get into. Yeah, absolutely. I know a lot of the articles I've been reading right now surrounding this issue have really talked about how these players are using their platform for um, bettering this cause and really reaching out to the public. But at the same time, they're also, in a sense, only reaching areas that maybe are not 
they don't need to be reached as much as far as the audience and as far as the team owners. And um, so it, it is a very difficult issue. And um, I, I know you mentioned sports and politics and that's intersecting right here completely. And um, I wanted to ask you, do you think that sports and politics should be kept separate? Um, or when do you think that they should intersect? So it's funny, like I, I tend to agree with that, but if, but saying that and it's, you know, saying sports and politics are separate is almost saying a, something political in and of itself, which I don't really believe. I believe that, you know, players, you know, they're entitled to, uh, you know, player empowerment. I don't, you know, just a similar example. I don't own any guns, but if people want to own guns, you know, go ahead. If players want to boycott games, go ahead. Um, you know, I think it's a separate issue. So where I think there's probably more, we'll say, um, bipartisan agreement. I think the politicians being in sports is, is a separate issue and that's on both sides. So that's a guy, you know, high level guy, you know, I'm, I'm from the Northeast I'm from New York, Cory Booker in, uh, in New Jersey is coming up with a, which I think is a very, um, uh, I think a very smart plan for name, image and likeness, you know, and he's was one of the guys spearheading, uh, you know, it was a level where uh, colleges were in a lot of big 10 schools, a lot of the schools by you guys were requiring their athletes to sign COVID-19 waivers in order to play. And if they weren't playing, uh, they could potentially forfeit their scholarships. So Cory Booker, I think very, you know, former college football player over at Stanford, he, you know, proposed legislation. He got it out really quick um, to, uh, I guess, save these athletes from potential punishment from the school. It's great, but it opens the door of Pandora's box, which has inevitably led itself. Uh, and again, I, I don't read into anything I'm saying. I'm very politically neutral. Um, but if the president is involved in a, in a Big Ten, uh, whether they're going to survive or not, he's speaking to the commissioner of college football. It's unavoidable, unavoidable. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a great point. And then um, kind of going off of that as well, I know historically sporting events have been used as um, propaganda tools by governments and, and by different groups of people. And um, do you see that this um, either being the same type of a concern right now, or do you see a future concern stemming from this incident? Do you, do you think that there's potential for in the future um, this uh, boycotting in sports to be used as a tool um, that could be a, an even more um, serious propaganda tool? Um, so whoever, you know, uh, I, feel like, I feel like we'll say nine out of 10 law students are on Instagram. I think a, a lesser sect of that is on Twitter. For that uh, smaller sect on Twitter, it's, that is very rampant that, that college sports or sports are being used as some type of uh, political tool, which, you know, I guess we can just talk about the Big Ten, um, which, is, which is very uh, valid today. Um, the Big Ten and, uh, you know, I know Paige and I don't, I don't want to step too much on, on that topic, but just, you know, very briefly, the Big Ten, and the long and short of that, and again, we'll, we'll parse it out, but the Big Ten uh, parents, you know, obviously the, the season fall football has been canceled. Parents, players, they just want transparency on, on how the season was canceled. They just want to know what reports were relied upon, what medical experts were relied upon, who voted where, um, and this is very important, right? The Big Ten doesn't want to provide that transparency, and they're a private organization, the Big Ten. They are under no legal obligation to provide that transparency. Individual public schools, 13 of 14 schools in the Big Ten are public. So there's another way of getting at it, but on, on their face, the Big Ten doesn't have to provide that. Now, if, you're, if you make a statement that you're not going to provide those answers to the parents and, the, and the, your own football players underneath your roof and you're, they end up suing you, which is not a good look, I don't think you can avoid the optics when you go as the commissioner, Kevin Ward of the Big Ten, uh, I know a Notre Dame alum, so just, just uh, again, I'm just pointing out what happened. Uh, he agreed to meet with President Trump, spoke, or spoke to him, I don't know if they met in person, but 15 to 20 minutes over the phone, a productive conversation on, um, just a quote, uh, you know, how to save uh, Big Ten fall football. So I think that unquestionably has the optics of a political motivation. I don't know if that's actually was his intention, and I don't, don't mean to put a, uh, say anything, but all I can point out is there's no transparency to the constituents and there's, you know, um, a 15 to 20 minute open conversation with the president of the United States. Yeah, definitely. And I know um, we were really excited also to talk about the Big Ten topic and kind of transition to that. I, I do want to get into that. Um, I have one last question about um, boycott strike issues. And um, 
Do you think that NBA owners have the power to make a significant difference in terms of lobbying? I know that that's something that the players are um, thinking is uh, wrapped into what they're asking for, but what's your take on that? Money talks. Um, you know, I'm, uh, people couldn't tell. Jerry Maguire was a, one of my favorite movies growing up. Um, the NBA owners are among the wealthiest of the wealthy. It's not even the 1%. It's the 1% of 1% of 1%. Um, uh, you know, where there's been talks recently about who's going to buy the Mets. There's a guy, Steve Cohn, who's from uh, my, my part of New York in Westchester County. Uh, he's made $10 billion, right? These owners are the wealthiest of the wealthy. And if you can in inject that money into low socioeconomic areas, you know, affordable housing, if, if those are the type of demands that the players would like met, um, you know, that's uh, to economically something that they can do. And, and beyond that, let's say the owners were not independently wealthy, which they 100% are. The NBA is a multi, multi-billion dollar business. And the NBA is controlled by a board of governors who are made up of those same owners. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think that could be a potential tool of change. I, I will say, um, you know, I, if the question is, can they? Yes, of course they can. There is a, you know, and I, I do like to just at least address both sides. For whatever reason, I didn't realize this was such a big issue. Every time I talk about the NBA, there's a handful of, you know, uh, people that bring up, and it's a fair point, you know, the NBA's handling of the China situation was just left a lot to be desired. So, um, so the question, second question, can they? Yes, I 100% think they can enact change. Will they? I think um, Adam Silver, uh, he picks his spots when to inject himself politically. And I think they've made some a tremendous movement with the names of the jerseys, you know, uh, you know, social justice uh, expressions on the back. But, you know, it wasn't a blank slate. You couldn't say whatever exactly you wanted on the back because the NBA is a multi-billion dollar international business. So um, Adam Silver, you know, a, a former lawyer, really smart guy. Um, I think he knows how to wade that line properly. But, you know, again, uh, if you wanted to give him some demerits for the handling of the China situation, uh, I, I think that is a, a completely fair criticism. Yeah, I agree with um, both sides of what you were saying. I'm actually writing a paper on NBA and China relations right now. So I've been doing a lot of research into that. And um, there's definitely that argument for taking care of what happens at home first. But at the same time, uh, human rights are for sure in question. So I, I absolutely agree. And um, I, I know this issue is very related as well to Big Ten and what's going on in college football right now. And um, as you know, students of Notre Dame, we're all very excited about um, football coming up next weekend. And football is definitely a topic that's on our minds. So I, I really want to dive right into something you brought up a little bit already about President Trump and Kevin Warren um, speaking. And I, I think it was over the phone as well. I'm not sure if it was in person, but I know Trump recently tweeted that he had a productive conversation with Kevin Warren about immediately starting up Big Ten football. And then he said, would be great for everyone, players, fans, country on the one yard line. So I guess starting off this conversation and this topic, uh, what are your thoughts on this? And are there any potential liability concerns with playing football, um, even beyond the obvious uh, in your expertise? 100%. Uh, there is certainly liability concerns. Um, there was a report yesterday. Um, the, the, I just think there's a lot of, uh, again, it's just, you know, we're all lawyers here. And uh, I guess this is probably just a good, you know, teaching moment, a good case study. In, in law, there's always going to be two lawyers, more, more often, two lawyers on the opposite sides. Uh, and you might have a case, and I've had plenty, and I see some of my Goldberg Segala colleagues uh, on here as well where you are so confident that you were right in something and then you go to court oral argument and the other person is equally as confident they are right about something. So you could look at the same exact set of facts uh, and come to two very different conclusions. So, um, you know, in my case of Goldberg Segala, you know, I, I handle um, you know, some commercial cases. I handle uh, a lot of cases involving um, expert testimony. So you can hire an expert uh, and same thing like lawyers have two different opinions, experts can have two different opinions. So that's essentially what's going on um, in the, across the college football landscape. Uh, just talking about the conferences, I believe there are 10 conferences in total for, for college football. Uh, uh, I think four of them have canceled at this point, Big Ten, Pac-12, Mountain West, and I'm, oh, and the MAC. So it's basically six to four. That tells you a good indication that medical experts are disagreeing on what is safe and what's not safe. Um, Penn State, there was a report that came out yesterday that you know 30% of their players uh, we're showing some symptoms of, of you know, heart issue, myocarditis, and then, a, you know, a somewhat pseudo retraction. So 
there's a lot of you know misinformation a lot of just uh you know people uh, like if you just go on on twitter now there's a twitter school of medicine everyone has an honorary degree uh, you know some people say they have a, a twitter school of law degree um, but nobody really knows what they're talking about and i think if anyone told you they know for 100 percent certainty um then they would just you could just not believe them because that just is not the world we live in so you know the obvious liability issue and the one um you know i if you had to put what I do in one category, it's mainly mainly tort law, I guess some breach of contract law. Um, this is essentially, right, uh, you know, an asbestos case, right? It's a, it's a toxic tort case. Um, the scary part for these schools is that the statute of limitations doesn't run from the point of contamination. It doesn't run from the point of infection. It doesn't run from college football season. It's going to run from the point you start manifesting symptoms of COVID-19, which might not be year one, it might not be year five. You can have an asbestos case that doesn't start until 10 years in. So that's the scary part for schools because there's a dollars and cents version of this, right? Um, insurance premiums are gonna skyrocket over the course of that period of time that you think you need coverage. And that period of time is almost unlimited because who knows when you're gonna manifest symptoms. Um, it's like, a you know, for those that aren't that big into torts, it's like cold case, right? There's no statute of limitations on murder you always got to be worried if you're murder and you committed a crime, you know, watch your back because those forensic files guys are going to get you. But um, yeah, so 100% certain liability. Um, I will say this duty and breach is pretty clear. You have a duty to protect the students on your campus. Uh, the breach of that could be pretty obvious if you don't follow proper, you know, reasonable protocol. The one that I think um, ultimately uh, that schools are going to uh, lean on and I think have a, a very good chance of defending these is that third element of causation. The harm, well, obviously, we know what that, what that is. Um, the causation element, you have to show that something or someone's duty or, you know, lack thereof was the proximate cause of you having some type of harm. Now, short of a bubble scenario where there is no outside factors that could possibly be impacting you, you know, if someone goes to CVS and they pick up something or they go to the restaurant, who, what's not, we have no, COVID is not so sophisticated, but we know where COVID-19 came from. So um, that would be my argument if I'm representing one of the schools. Um, I would make that argument. I'd slam to the table and I'd say, causation, you can't show it, you know, right? Um, there's that, uh, just, there's no way of really showing it. I just don't think it's possible. But that's, that being said, again, you know, for my Goldberg Scala defense colleagues over here, um, there is a, uh, it's, it's very expensive to defend cases to the point where you're filing a summary judgment motion on causation grounds. You have to take depositions. Uh, you know, obviously insurance premiums are gonna go up defending that. So, you know, uh, it's not what happened in this country. Maybe it should have, you know, people can debate that. Different countries had a lockdown, right, for a year, and then they, they came back, and those countries tend to be doing a little bit better. I think that that's, uh, in theory, what the Big Ten um, and the Pac-12 are kind of doing. But obviously, you know, um, there are some live components to campus happening, uh, you know, for those two uh, conferences. So, uh, but I think that's the general gist, right? You'd rather just try to uh, push this issue down the road and maybe in eight months or maybe you know five months from now, you have a vaccine and the whole point is moot and those schools will look like geniuses, but uh, they're gonna be missing out on, on a substantial amount of revenue and not to mention um, disrupting all of college football uh, for eternity if there's fall and spring football. So just that little, that little disruption. Absolutely. I know a um, little plug for my volleyball coach, who was a uh, uh, Central Michigan coach for the Mac schools. He recently tweeted that um, we all want to play football, but there's so many issues involved. So obviously we all want to play. I know I want us to play, but it's, it's those types <laughs> of things that we need to think about because those are some huge repercussions. And um, so I guess kind of going off of that, uh, Tom Mars recently uh, started to represent a group of families that are suing the Big Ten right now and um, saying that the university presidents failed to consult with the board prior to this vote to not play. So I wanted to ask you just a little bit about your thoughts on that and um, what do you think of this suit and kind of what do you think the next steps are and how it's going to unfold? So that sounds like you have been reading my, my Twitter uh, timeline. I might've put that up like half an hour ago um yeah so just to uh i guess to clear up some issues so tom uh tom mars who uh, i didn't know this and see he was on our our recent podcast that was released a couple hours ago um tom mars uh i didn't realize how impressive his background was he's a, a former you know uh private sector commercial litigator got called into uh to be walmart's chief legal officer uh and then went back into private practice as almost a superstar uh, and of all people, he ended up living next to Houston Nutt, former um, SEC coach, who I know a lot of people will be familiar with. 
Houston Nutt, uh, people will uh, recall, was involved in a uh, messy lawsuit a couple of years ago. And he went to his neighbor, Tom Mars, the uh, just fantastic private sector attorney. And all of a sudden, Tom Mars became almost the de facto college football attorney. So Tom Mars has represented, uh, you know, he's made a name for himself helping players transfer schools without, um, you know, without taking off the year. Uh, and that's big guys as big as Justin Fields, probably, you know, the number two quarterback uh, in the draft when we have it. Um, behind number one, Trevor Lawrence. Uh, and then, uh, you know, Shea Patterson, who you guys obviously know over uh, from Michigan. So, yeah, Tom, Tom Mars is really at the heart of this. Um, and I, I do, well, I'll, I'll save that for later. But the, the, he, he's being re retained by families to file what's called um, FOIA requests. That's a it's Freedom of Information Act, F-O-I-A. Uh, it's not so dissimilar from a discovery request that you have in a lawsuit, but it's a, basically a public records request from a, a public institution. So you can, um, I've made a FOIL, uh, in New York it's called Freedom of Information Law, FOIL, but um, I guess we're, whatever Tom is using, it's FOIA. Um, but it's, I've asked, you know, uh, municipalities, police officers, firefighters for different documents, be it an accident report or something, you know, employment files. So Tom is going after uh, the public universities in the Big Ten. That's everybody but Northwestern. Every other school is a public organization. And uh, if you follow him, he's a great follow on Twitter. Uh, this is, a, I guess, a component of e-discovery. What Tom has done is isolated 80 terms um, that would come up in emails. So, uh, and he wants to know exactly what happened uh, in this Big Ten vote, this alleged 11 to 3 vote where the, the, everything was canceled. So. Uh, he's making, uh, he wants emails from all these different schools with the word vote, uh, you know, the word board, directors, Kevin, Warren, commissioner. So it's pure lawyering. It's very interesting. He's, Tom's a really, really bright guy. So what um, he's doing, he's been retained to, uh, you know, try to get answers from the, from, uh, you know, from the Big Ten via these FOIA requests. So he's uh, been, he posts a lot of emails with different uh, Big Ten schools, which I think is very funny. Um, but yeah, so Tom is not retained right now for any type of active lawsuit. Um, the only active lawsuit, which I think we'll, we'll probably get into as well, is this Nebraska lawsuit. Tom, um, when we asked him about it on the podcast, has no affiliation to the uh, Nebraska lawsuit, right? That's a separate attorney, a private attorney in uh, Nebraska State Court suing uh, the Big Ten. Definite home court advantage over there uh, if you're going to sue uh, the Big Ten and you're Nebraska and you're in Nebraska State Court. Um, but yeah, so very much uh, Tom is at the heart of this. What I will say in the, in the quote that you're reading, Tom gave us a really good nugget, which um, I'm sitting here on my phone. I'm getting a lot of pings of different retweets and people liking it. But um, essentially, Tom has, from his various intel, his various phone calls with parents, administrators, however he's doing it, he believes what occurred uh, was that presidents who um, certainly, uh, via the Big Ten bylaws, at least what I've seen of them, at least what's been released, have the authority to make a vote. Presidents, of course, on behalf of the school, should be able to vote on the school. That's, that's their, you know, either the chancellor or the president. Um, for some reason, um, you know, presidents have been very, some, there's at least two presidents, Minnesota's and Michigan State's president, that have said that either A, a vote did not occur, or that it was unclear if a vote occurred. Um, so there is, the Big Ten is putting forward statements, you know, and, and legal briefs in this Nebraska case, where they are saying, uh, that a vote occurred and it's explicitly clear and it's 11 to three. So Tom and I were talking on the podcast. I go candidly, how is it possible that two people in the room don't know if a vote occurred? And what Tom explained, um, at least from his intel, that there's a world where presidents were basic, and you can imagine, I can imagine this happening at work one day. You were called into a room, you didn't know a vote was gonna happen. You know, they asked for a vote and you kind of half raised your hand, you weren't sure. And that was the vote that they took. And then all of a sudden, there's a vote that's out there that it's been canceled. And at no point uh, prior did you consult with your board of directors as to whether or not you actually could vote that way, right? If a, maybe the board wanted to tell you to vote A or B. So what Tom is saying, I think it's conceivable. Um, and we'll see what comes out. Tom would be in the know uh, that the board's board of directors might, uh, might roll some heads because they were not consulted prior to the official vote uh, canceled of the season. So at least one theory, I do think there is, uh, it's definitely plausible. Yeah, definitely. That's, I know, personally, something I want to keep tabs on. I think that sounds like a very interesting uh, case, and it'll be very interesting to see what the outcome is. And um, also, I, I know you mentioned Trevor Lawrence, and speaking of him, he's, he's been pretty active on Twitter, um, tweeting about the um, different 
uh, cancellations in football and uh, conference cancellations and how like, he personally wants to play. And uh, something that he tweeted, and I know you've mentioned this on your podcast briefly as well, um, kind of got this question a little bit from there. But um, so he is stating that people are just as much, if not more at risk if we don't play. And he's saying that because the players are sent home, a lot of them have worse off situations there. And then uh, players right now are coming back from situations that are not too good for them. And uh, he's really saying that football is a safe haven for all of them. And so are there COVID related benefits to playing college football, do you think? I think if you put a doctor on the stand and you put them under sworn oath, I think the safest way, if you're the ACC's doctor, um, you know, the doctor from Duke they relied on, I know the Big 12 has their own doctor. If you put them on the stand, I think they would all admit that the safest way to play football during a pandemic is to not play football at all. Um, to Trevor Lawrence's point, uh, I do think it would probably be safer for them to be on campus, um, you know, with the top, uh, we'll say the top facilities in the, in the country, obviously better than what they're going to receive at home in their private homes. Um, but if you have access to, you know, in theory, Notre Dame's uh, athletic facilities and their, and their team doctors, their team nurses, it's going to be much healthier for them, I would think, in terms of monitoring, in terms of technology than if they're in their homes. Um, but to answer your direct question, I don't think anyone can... Uh, realistically make an argument that it's safer to play football than to not play at all. Now, separate question, um, you know, and, and I guess it's important legal point page there, you, you as a, as a venue, um, you are under no obligation to provide a perfectly safe means uh, for someone to uh, watch a game or play a game. That's not the law. It's not perfectly safe. It's reasonably safe. So, um, you know, uh, we are in America, right? The, the reasonable peers of sports, we do kind of have to look at other countries, what other countries are doing. Um, you know, the NBA is playing in a bubble and everyone wanted to kill Major League Baseball for not having a bubble, same with the NFL. But if you just look across the global sports landscape, even countries that were hit comparably in terms of we were to COVID, no bubble. So the NFL, and I, and I think I understand it, and Dr. Alan Sills over there, you know, he had a little disagreement with Dr. Fauci. Um, but it's a battle of the experts like we'd have in any of our legal cases. It's not being perfect like the NBA, which definitely is safe. bubble is safer. You don't have to be perfectly safe. You just have to be reasonably safe. So uh, I think the argument we're seeing across campuses um, is the question of whether you can uh, in the ACC and the SEC have a reasonably safe way to play football. Uh, and I think Trevor Lawrence is kind of saying the benefits outweigh the risks. Um, and it's a, it's a medical question. It's also a legal question because if you're wrong, right, and there are a wave of COVID-19 lawsuits, um, even if you don't lose the lawsuits, right, if you just hit with 400 of them, right, the crazy number, um, that's going to A, probably uh, A, not look good for further recruits, but B, it's going to put a giant hole uh, in your wallet. So it's a very big gamble. You know, I, I'm a, uh, I let's say I'm like a decent poker player, but this is a, this is a very high stakes game of poker. Uh, and a, you know, it's almost like you're being asked to go all in without knowing all the information. COVID, well, it's only been around for um, uh, I lost you for a yeah. second, but I think I can okay. hear you now. Yeah, there's, we don't know the long-term ramifications of the virus. So it's very much playing, uh, you know, going all in when you're only uh, at the flop. You haven't seen the turn of the river. So, um, it's definitely a gamble one way or the other. If you're the Big Ten, you can see the downside of not playing. Everyone hates you and wants to fire you and wants to go after you and suing you in court. Um, and, you know, um, we'll see what the ramifications are. Hopefully there are none, um, but the definitely clear liability that could result. Right. It, it really does seem like a situation where you just can't win. And it's, it's more just a, a little bit of a game of... Uh, rolling the roulette right now and hoping for good luck. And um, I, I know kind of moving on to a related but separate topic, on top of all of this, um, name, image, and likeness legislation is also going through the process right now. So I wanted to just ask you also a little bit about your um, stance on an opinion on that. So if Congress does pass the NIL legislation, um, what will the role of the NCAA be in college athletics? And what do you think the congressional role will be if they become um, really the oversight? So it's a great question. Um, Paige, I, I should give you credit. These are actually very good questions. They're very Thank hard. you. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I wrote an article and I'm happy to share it with anyone that's interested. Um, when Fair Pay to Play passed back in, uh, probably it was October, November at this point, um, there were some troubling comments that I heard from a couple
couple of ADs, uh, Wisconsin, number one, Ohio State, number two, that if, if and when fair pay to play actually passes, uh, that they, these schools and maybe there's other schools, but that they weren't going to schedule games against the California schools because it would be unfair um, for California schools to be able to have a massive, which would it would be a, a massive recruiting edge. And so in theory, right, you know, um, Trevor Lawrence might not go to Clemson. He would go to UCLA and, and you know, and so on and, and so on and so forth. So that was their argument then. Um, I, I think now why you see the NCAA reaching out to um, Congress to ask for an antitrust exemption is probably for that same reason. Uh, right now, right, um, the, the one that we'd be most worried about on the name image like this one in terms of states is Florida. That will come into effect uh, the earliest of any of the 50 states that are, you know, I, don't, I don't think it's probably, I'm not sure how many states have passed this point, but the earliest in the country, July of 2021 is when in Florida, you can make, uh, you can make compensation off your name, image, and likeness. So uh, we had the conversation about California. Now we're all, all eyes are on Florida because California is not um, enacting fair pay to play until 2023. So we'll put them in the burner for now. Florida is where that first battleground is fought. So if the NCA were to come out and say, okay, guys, these are our uniform, uh, our uniform wage limits, right? I think they called them, uh, they wanted to put guardrails to make sure that uh, athletes weren't getting too much compensation and resembling pros. But the problem is once the NCA actually has an official, right, uh, wage compensation system, right, whatever you want to call it, uh, then you might be running afoul of potential uh, antitrust violations, maybe for wage restriction. You know, we don't know what the guardrails are going to be, but uh, at least the people I spoke to that might be in the know said that a, a potential cap on earnings could be in play, right? You know, if they, if they keep saying that we don't want our, you know, college athletes look like pros, a cap on earnings would be one of those things to accomplish that. So um, I guess on an initial level, right, if the NCAA is coming up with this type of uniform system, which I don't know if everybody wants, I mean, maybe other states will be more, uh, you know, uh, like in New York, for example, there's proposed legislation to literally give college athletes a piece of the revenue pie. So whatever the schools make in total, that's divvied up to the athletes, which is very different than Florida, very different than, um, than California. It's not passed, but it's, it's proposed, it's out there. Um, so if the NCAA does come up with their uniform system and they beat Florida to the punch, right, they, they get by there before July, uh, there is a reasonable uh, chance that they could, you know, get hit with an antitrust challenge for any type of what they call these guardrails that they, they presented to the Board of Governors. So um, to answer your question, I, I think if I'm the NCAA, I'm, why am I reaching out for antitrust protection? Because you're seeing this at a very high level. You know, you're not going to come up with this wage compensation system just to get hit uh, with a giant antitrust violation. So I don't know what the NCAA's role is as gatekeeper. Um, I think as we've seen, uh, the NCAA in, in certain situations, particularly here, Paige, in the topic we just talked about, they have no, you know, uh, Mark Emmert, the president of the NCAA, has has no power over these college football conferences. There's literally no power. It's almost a separate entity, the, the, the power five over there. So, you know, it, it remains to be seen what the NCAA will look like, especially, you know, if uh, if schools are just going to go and go off and do their own thing. So the, the article I referenced, which is an interesting one, it's kind of talking about what doomsday would look like. If you really banned, if you went forward, and I don't, I don't actually think it's going to happen, but you can only take it with a grain of salt that they've threatened it. If you threatened to ban California schools or Florida schools, you know, from the NCAA, the schools don't disappear. They would create a separate competing version of the NCAA, whatever that might be. Um, so I think uh, it's important to note, I mean, just for the historians, and I know I see um, Professor Edmonds, I, I imagine is familiar with this, this college football association uh, in the 80s, when a number of really big schools from Oklahoma to Georgia, they wanted to separately negotiate their TV rights um, outside of the NCAA's um, confines. Uh, and the NCAA similarly threatened to ban all of those schools from competition. I think Oklahoma at the time was the national champion who was threatened to be banned from competition. So it's happened before. They're threatening it in the past, you know, past 12 months. So I think that is a very interesting battle. And I think anybody that's looking for a note to write, uh, I think that is very fertile ground, uh, you know, from a number of different angles. Absolutely. I'm sure after this year, there's going to be so many notes written on this topic because it's just, uh, it's very up and coming recent and also just interesting across the board and something we haven't seen recently. Um, and I, I would also love to ask 
more questions about um, NIL legislation, but at the same time, just for time's sake, I, I do want to move into um, Dan Schneider and the Washington football team, which um, formerly known as the Redskins. Um, I, I just want to ask a little bit um, about what your take is on the most serious parts of the background of this issue and just um, provide a little bit of a framework as to like where the issues are today. I think this looks better with the light actually on, you know, just, just my, my two cents. But, right. um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, uh, again, for those that follow me, I, I don't, I don't really have such strong, I try to stay pretty neutral and just report it. Um, but when it comes to uh, Dan Snyder or Roger Goodell, um, you know, sometimes I, I can't help myself. Uh, Dan Snyder, for those that don't know, is the owner of the uh, Washington football team, formerly the Washington, um, you know, name starts with an R. Uh, I guess the, the plight of Dan Snyder and the, and the reason why this is uh, in the sports law conversation and not just, uh, you know, sports talk radio, there is real conversations going on uh, at a very high level of football as to uh, what, at what point does the an organization require either a suspension or b a type of uh, you know the death sentence of a Donald Sterling um, when you know you could potentially lose a franchise. So what's going on in Washington? And just an interesting conversation. Um, first of all, uh, you know, um, cancel culture. Uh, you know, for a period of time in this country is, is very real and it's, it's accomplished some very good things. Um, you know, uh, I think the the name the Washington Football Team's name change is long overdue. Um, but uh, I guess Snyder uh, tended to put his foot in his mouth. I think maybe four or five years ago, they were challenged. I think it was actually 2016 at this point, but there's a great South Park episode, which I highly recommend everyone watching. I'm sorry, Professor Edmonds. I don't know how PC it is, but it is very educational. Um, you know, the, the, at a certain point, there was a group that challenged the Washington, I'll, I'll just hopefully no one's attended, the Washington Redskins. They challenged that name and said that that was uh, uh, an improper and vulgar name and was not worthy of any trademark protection. So in this window, I believe it was two years, uh, and South Park capitalized on this. Uh, the Washington football team, now formerly Washington Redskins, had no trademark protection. So if you watch the South Park episode, um, Eric Cartman makes a, a, a company called the Washington Redskins, and he can say it because for a period of time, there was no trademark protection. During that time, people had said very clearly to Dan Snyder, uh, hey, you probably should think of a name change, right? You maybe you should take out some additional federal trademarks because this name looks like it's not really worth anything. And Snyder kind of doubled down twice, three, four times and said, I will never change the name. It's never going to happen. Looks like it's happened to Mr. Snyder. Um, so Dan has, has not given the NFL the best look over the years. He's been very brazen. And I'm, and I'm not sure why he, he would put his foot down. Um, just kidding. I know exactly why he lifted his foot up because uh, a number of very lucrative sponsors from FedEx threatened to pull complete uh, and utter sponsorship from the team if they didn't change the name. So it's not, A, a that's really not a good look for um, an NFL owner that in order to advance, uh, you know, uh, social rights or civil rights, you need to be held hostage for $200 million, $500 million. That's A, not a good look. But, you know, the stranger things have happened. Uh, in the last uh, five months, probably right around there, uh, a top player, first round, former first round pick, big player at LSU, Darius Geis. Uh, there was an allegation that came out that he had raped, uh, uh, had rape charges, rape allegations at LSU that Washington knew about, drafted him anyway. And, you know, it's at least allegations, but that, that they drafted him knowing that and never did anything about it since then. They've released him. Uh, news this morning, just my own personal sake, they released a, a Hall of Famer, future Hall of Famer, Adrian Peterson. So something, there's a different uh, changing of the guard going on there. Um, now, the reason, uh, again, Snyder is uh, in the news from a potential losing his team level, uh, the Washington Post, uh, about a month ago at this point, had a, a very big story about a toxic culture that existed uh, in the Washington football franchise. Uh, and this was after they announced the name change, after they announced that everything toxic culture was going to change, you know, a new culture, a new beginning Washington football team. Within about a week or two of that uh, is when the Washington Post comes out and says, well, before we turn the page, let's look at what this previous page said. Uh, cheerleaders harassed, uh, it's from up and down the organization, a number of individuals, high ranking individuals were fired within the team, just from this uh, story coming out. And uh, you know, the, the Washington Post reaching out to the football team for comment and they would fire these guys one by one. So not a good look, number one. Um, but that being said, you know, I, I just totally, you know, there was no bombshell, at least with respect to Dan Snyder. He was in no way involved in it, whether or not it was a Joe Paterno situation, should he have known, um, separate issue, but 
he was not in any way tied to the allegations. Fast forward uh, about a week ago at this point, the Washington Post had a second follow-up story, which alleged uh, Larry Michael, who was the former um, you know, broadcasting, uh, head of the broadcasting booth for the Redskins, had directed a member of the video department, AV department. Uh, I guess there was a, some type of beach cheerleader bikini photo shoot. And whether or not the, well, not whether, the allegation is that the cheerleaders did not know that there was, uh, we'll say behind the scenes or some issues of wardrobe malfunctions, like a special edition cut that this individual, Larry Michael, now a former team official, uh, made for Dan Snyder. He goes, make Dan this special, I think he said, the, the special cut. Um, so that's an allegation that directly ties Dan Snyder into all of this. And you cannot, you can really no longer feign ignorance if that video A exists or B landed on your desk. So um, just the way that we see uh, these cases unfold, these Me Too type cases, that takes a couple brave women, you know, four or five brave women. And like we saw with the, you know, Harvey Weinstein cases, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and, and it goes on, but it takes that initial few. Um, so what we have now, uh, it would be very strange if this was it, right? And just with his history with these types of sexual harassment claims, um, again, it might not be tying Dan Snyder, but it might be about the organization, uh, that it could just be the tip of the iceberg. I think it's probably realistic to expect that more people will come forward. Um, and then the question becomes, right, Jerry Richardson, uh, former owner of the Carolina Panthers, uh, he had allegations, it was a Sports Illustrated story that um, he just had issues with racial insensitivity throughout the organization in his personal life. Uh, allegations, you know, um, people came forward, um, but that is what caused Jerry Richardson to sell his team, a little internal pressure from the NFL. Um, they did not enact any particular bylaws, although there, are, although there are some, to force him to sell the team. Um, he just sold it on his own because he wanted to get out of the spotlight. That is the direction we are trending to um, for the NFL and Dan Snyder again. Uh, even someone, um, you know, from the history of baseball, Marge Schott, who said some very pretty non-PC things in her life, um, sold the Cincinnati Reds once upon a time, but it was not because Major League Baseball forced her to do it. She, they probably could have, they did not. Uh, and even Donald Sterling was banned for life from the NBA, but it was not, uh, it was not the NBA that actually forced his hand and, and put a gun to his head and told him to sell. It's actually more directly tied to his separate uh, divorce with his wife. Um, and then obviously the team was sold from there. So yeah, that's that's the direction we're trending towards. It's another one that's super ripe of legal issues on all grounds, and one that it's uh, I'd be shocked if we didn't see more developments on that. Um, and I think uh, Paige, the other part that I think is interesting that I, on a newsworthy level, uh, and the other shoe to drop before I guess there's two post stories in between uh, in between the two. Dan Snyder took, kind of took the bull by the horns and said, "I'm going to hire uh, an attorney." to perform um, what he called an independent investigation. And Xavier's laughing because he knows that it's not an independent investigation. If you hire your own lawyer, you pay their bills and you ask them to come up with a conclusion for you. It's, that's, that's by no means independent. Um, but uh, you hired that attorney and she was performing a report. Uh, now post the second Washington story um, about Snyder being tied to it, uh, you can, well, I, uh, the, the end of it is that Roger Goodell has now intervened. He is now taking over. Uh, this, this lawyer will report directly to Roger Goodell. If you ask me, and uh, you know, if, uh, if you listen to my last, last podcast, you know my thoughts. I, I have no idea why the NFL didn't just fire the attorney and hire a new one. That's a little bit closer to an independent investigation. Um, but uh, that being said, it's almost unheard of in professional sports for an investigation to be intervened. It's one thing to have the NFL do the investigation. It's one thing to have the team do investigation. So it sends a very big signal if the NFL were to intervene and uh, ratchet up the importance of that investigation. So uh, that's a big report that people should be looking for. Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, for lack of a better term, uh, obviously they need to be woke in many different areas. <laughs> with um, how their workplace is set up with their different sexual misconduct allegations. And I know when I was reading about this, um, one thing that really shocked me was um, Stephen Choi, the organization CFO, directed the Human Resources Department to email all employees a conduct policy, which actually restricted the movement of women in the building to minimize their interaction with players. And it reportedly was intended to prevent player distraction. Um, and these are workplace women. This isn't even on the field. And um, so how does this policy play into evidence for this case and overall background? And also how does it apply to both employment law in general and then the NFL law? Just a couple, couple really good points. Um, you know. Uh, employment law, you know, this is, you have to call it what you see it. I mean, th this appears to be the makings of a gender discrimination claim. 
um, uh, the sexual harassment claim, uh, maybe a combination of the two, uh, depending on who's bringing the allegations. Um, so it's a very messy look. Uh, it's, it's, it's from certainly all angles of uh, non pc -ness. The Redskins are, you know, if you're going to say, I made a joke that it was like sports law bingo, but this is, they're checking every box that they're not supposed to check. Um, so you can change the name, but you know, um, it's the expression, right? Like you can, you can put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig, right? And this is the Washington who I think in the first row, they have like the people wearing the pig mask. So um, yeah, it's, it's very messy uh, on, an, on an NFL level. Uh, you could see potential, like we saw Jim Mersey, the owner of the Colts, he uh, kind of separately, but he had a, a DWI uh, and you know there were some prescription pain kills found in the car. He was given a suspension as an owner. I think it was a $500,000 fine. You could see that. Um, and, and even a guy like Joe Paterno, I, I keep coming to the case, it's a similar one. Joe Paterno was not really involved in what was going on as far as we knew from Penn State, but Joe Paterno lost his job because of the pressure that was put on him by uh, the public that he should have done something. He should have known more. So that's what I think we're looking at in terms of a number of administrators uh, within the Washington football team culture, as well as all the way to the top um, with Dan Snyder. And uh, I will note, you know, there is uh, as much as, you know, the NFL intervenes, I think it's, um, I mean, I, I like the progress, you know, I guess as an aside, um, my wife and I watched The Bachelor, which, you know, it's a good show. It's, it's, it has nothing to do with sports law, but, you know, I think it's a positive change that you can have, uh, you know, an African-American bachelor, an African-American bachelorette. It is, it's good to, to have that. Um, it is, I don't think, as good of a look for the Washington Redskins um, in the middle of all this. I'm just, you know, they, it's a good thing to have the first uh, appointee of a, uh, a, you know, African-American president of an NFL organization. It's the Washington Redskins. Um, I don't know if it sends the best signal that in the middle of all of this chaos, you are throwing a bone to someone. I just don't think that sends the best look. Um, and then this past week, uh, Sean Taylor, the late great Sean Taylor, uh, you know, former Washington Redskins uh, safety. He's passed away 13 years ago, tragic, tragic incident. Um, African American uh, male, great, great player for the team. People have been clamoring for years that he had some tribute in the field, the statue, or, you know, something. Um, and uh, this past week, they named a road after him uh, to, into FedEx Field. So I don't think the optics look good. If the heat's against you and all of a sudden now you're caving, which looks eerily similar to why they caved to change their name in the first place. When the money started being pulled off the table is when you started to change the name. And, and that doesn't send, doesn't send the best look. So I'm, I'm hopeful uh, that um, there is change, that a good positive change, that these aren't just optics, but um, I think uh, they conclude, people wanna read it that way. I don't, I don't think they're necessarily wrong. Absolutely, those are those are some really good points, and um, I, I know each three of these topics they they go so deep. We could talk about them for hours, honestly. Um, I I know for time's sake, I do want to open it up to questions at this point. So um, please feel free um, to unmute yourself and uh, ask Dan any questions on these areas or um, even any other areas within sports law. Hey Dan, um, can you hear me? I can. Cool. Um, so when you're talking about if the, the NCAA might open itself up to an antitrust suit, if it does, Mace, come on. If it does um, change its NIL laws, because so you're, you're saying that all of a sudden now that they're allowing some sort of payment, but then they're going to cap the payment, that in itself is an antitrust violation. Do you think any players who would be angry enough to actually bring suit or would they be happy enough that they're making money in itself? Okay, good, very good question. And Jake, I wanna give you the proper introduction. Um, Jake is the uh, president of Loyola Law School's Sports and Entertainment Law Forum. Um, uh, Paige was kind enough to allow me to invite uh, certain people uh, and I will give Jake a second shout out. Uh, there was a separate, uh, uh, it's the Student Sports Law Network. It's a group similar to what you guys do at Notre Dame. It's a group that takes people like Jake, people like Paige from across the country and puts them in their a national sports law forum, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and Jake is the uh, committee, the competition committee chair. So he's organizing a national competition similar that occurs at Tulane. So definitely want to give Jake a shout out. It is Jake, absolutely free. Can you attest to that, counselor? It's very free. Very free. So, um, okay, to answer your question, uh, 
I will answer your question. I want to kind of give people another, maybe another potential note to write about that I'm, I'm half following. Um, so yes, I do think it's possible that that could 100% get challenged, right? If you were a big enough guy like Tim Tebow in Florida, who easily could have commanded, right? The, I don't think it's that crazy to say $100 million over the course of his U of F career, if not more. He's, you know, Tim Tebow was a god in Gainesville for a number of years. Um, I don't think that's crazy. So then, you know, Jake, the, the second question, so college football, right? There is no, if you want to go play in the pros, you have to go through the college football machine. There is no way around that. It just doesn't exist. Um, unless the rock wants to create something for the XFL, which is maybe exactly what he's planning to do. Um, that's your first potential note article. Uh, there is no way to get around, um, you know, uh, that for the NFL. The reason I bring that up, if you were the version of, we'll say, um, you know, Cam Newton, who was at least at one point was the top high school recruit in the country, or even Trevor Lawrence, right? Another great one. Um, you don't, you have to go through college football. So maybe you do challenge the, the system, right? If you want to make that much money. Now, the, the other one that I've been following, um, LeBron James Jr., who some will know as Bronny, uh, he recently, if people are into esports, he recently joined uh, FaZe, which is like an esport collective. They play different teams, uh, they play different games. So Bronny, who is a, uh, he's in high school, he's by no means a college athlete, has signed on in some, some type of capacity to play for FaZe in some type of video game capacity where there's compensation, there's rewards. So um, if you're just kind of forecasting that out two years, we just had a conversation with LaMelo Ball, who arguably forfeited his uh, college eligibility by signing a shoe deal as a high school senior. If you would ask me today whether LeBron James Jr.'s son has forfeited eligibility by signing with a professional video game team, I'd say that's a pretty, I'd say probably, or he's getting very close. Um, so Jake, what, I, what I'm getting at, uh, if you're a basketball player, a, history, a very high level high school basketball player, maybe you're better off not suing the NCA and antitrust and just going to play professionally in Australia, in Spain, go to the G League. So I don't, I think it depends on the sport to, to in short to answer your question. I could see a football player doing it, certainly. Uh, but I don't think a basketball player would go through that headache when 99% of the first, you know, the, the lottery picks are going to be one and done guys anyway. So actually, I don't think Bronny forfeited his eligibility if he wanted to play college basketball. I think the money has to be related to the sport that you're playing in college. So if he's getting paid to play video games, I don't think he's forfeiting eligibility to play basketball in college. I look forward to your law review article, Mr. Williams. Oh, I don't write. No, not yet. Not yet. yet. <laughs> um, all right. Thank you. What kind, I guess, follow up, what kind of guardrails do you think would not trigger uh, an antitrust violation? Yeah, I think if, so uh, my, my favorite, you know, for those antitrust law is a fantastic class. I think it's just a really interesting one. It's one of my favorite. Um, a wage restriction has to be pretty obvious. So if you can do it in a creative way, right, if you're going to somehow I think that maybe a more fair way to do it is if the school generated a certain amount of money, if you were capped at like, you couldn't generate more than like, I don't know, 1% of the school's total revenue, something along those lines. I think that's an easier way to hide it. But if you have a hard cap across the board, uh, that's going to look a very much like a wage restriction. So um, I don't think they, I don't think they, I mean, I think a wage restriction or a the cap is the cleanest way to do it. Um, but I think you're going to have to tie it to particular sports, to tie it to particular revenue and have it somewhat resembling having some concept of what a fair market economy would look like. I have no, again, I'm, I'm, I'm not envious of the NCA directors that have to figure this out. I have no idea how you pull that off. Um, and you, but you've said countless times, we don't want our student athletes to look like pros. You could have a system where there's no cap and there's no guardrails and guys can make a hundred million on campus. And my crazy theory, I think it would help if you've allowed guys to make millions of dollars in college, I think it would allow guys, especially in basketball, to stay for four years. They'd be the biggest man on campus. There's 100 schools. They, are, they could be the starting point guard and only 30 in the NBA. So I don't think it's crazy to say that allowing and really opening up the floodgates of NIL would increase revenue for, for the schools. If they have studs that are staying, like if Zion stayed at Duke for four years, uh, that would be fantastic for the economy of college basketball. But um, you know, I, don't, I don't think that's where they're leaning. Last follow-up question, big hypothetical. Do you think that the NCAA would ever recognize the players as an association, not necessarily a union, to collectively bargain this so that it wouldn't be an antitrust violation? Um, that's actually a great question. Um, I, I think, I don't, I don't want to rule that out. Um, and I will say, 
if we got any indication of this, um, this whole kind of COVID-19 COVID waiver issue, like the reason that it became moot and the reason the NSA stepped in really quickly from a, you know, in, in terms of a waiver, right? Just because you sign a waiver doesn't mean it's enforceable. There has to be some type of like bargain for exchange. It has to be somewhat equal, right? You can't have like David and, Go, you know, and, and Goliath on the other end. It has to be somewhat equal. So right. if you have a players association, um, you know, a union, a professional union that's organizing it, right? And you can help come up with the terms of this COVID-19 waiver, that's a little more fair. And I think, um, you know, maybe you'd have the Big Ten and the Pac-12 right now if you had a college football union that collectively bargained for what this waiver was going to look like. Um, I think, if anything, I mean, I've never, I think that's the biggest reason you, at least in, in nowadays, why it would have helped it. And then obviously, um, you know, you, if as a, uh, you know, as a, within a union, if, if you have certain, uh, I think it's the, I'm going to probably mess up and Professor Edmonds, don't, don't, don't yell at me if I get this wrong. I think it's the non-statutory labor exemption. If you uh, have an antitrust violation, but you agree to it within your CBA, you're allowed to do that. I think that's the general gist of it. So to your point, Jake, assuming I'm correct, I see some, some slight nods, but I think I didn't, didn't totally mess that up. Um, I, I think you'd be, uh, it'd be in your interest to um, create a union to, uh, and, and the CBA to potentially get around some of those adverse issues. Cool. Thank you. Not all at once, team. I mean, I just can't um, handle this many questions. I had uh, one specific question. Um, in regards to the new G League program, you see like the incoming like prospects for this year's um, like freshman uh, basketball and everything. Um, you see a lot of them are like, it was the number one, the number three, and I think the number 17 pick all went with the G League program. How do you think the new G League program will expedite the NCAA allowing players to or um, like make money off their image or likeness, or do you think most players will just wind up forfeiting basketball in college and going into the G League program? It's a, it's a great question. Um, so UCLA, uh, I think one of, I'm not gonna remember the guy's name off him, but it was one of the, the top point guards in the country was committed to UCLA, decommitted to go play in the G League for, I think it was like $400,000, somewhere around there, low, low six figures. Um, so UCLA, you know, the, you know, uh, the first state to allow players to make money off their name, image, and likeness in theory is the one that gets hurt by it. One of the first schools to get hurt by it and their player drops out to go make money um, in the G League. So I think you, if you were the NCAA, you'd be really, you, you'd be very smart to look at the money that the G League is paying their players. There's going to be, you know, I, I live in Westchester County, New York. We have the Westchester Knicks. Uh, I've been to that stadium a number of times. It is the opposite of state of the art, whatever, whatever that is. Um, so they're not, they're never going to be these big television crews. They're really horrendous facilities. Um, so you're not, I mean, there's a give and take, obviously, you know, Notre Dame is beautiful facilities, Duke, you know, so on and so forth. Um, but if you're looking at these guys getting paid 500 grand, 200 grand, 300 grand, if you don't have a system that allows the players to legitimately make six figures, um, for the top athletes, right? You might be telling yourself to the point I was telling Jake, what's the point of even getting paid at all if you're making 25,000? I'd rather, if it's for one year and one year only, I'd rather be, you know, uh, Brandon Jennings who played in Spain once upon a time for a couple million dollars. I'd rather be Lamelo Ball who played in beautiful Australia for a year and didn't, doesn't seem to have hurt his draft stock at all. Um, and mind you, you know, Mateo, this is the other interesting part. Uh, the G League, I'm not sure if, uh, you know, G League's competing against a couple, in Australia, they're competing against other entities. But if the level of competition, right, G League is is made up of guys who are like, you know, the equivalent of a third round pick, right, not quite good enough for the, the version of quad A players for baseball. That's, and they're grown men, right? Those players are going to be better than the level of competition at college. So, you know, that's another reason that you'd go want to play another year or two to get that much better before you have to enter the draft pool. So, um I think that that is a, a, uh, a very, very smart, another savvy decision by Adam Silver to, um, you know, siphon some talent away and draw some more eyeballs to uh, the minor leagues, which, you know, I've, other than the Westchester Knicks who had, uh, uh, who had um, Jimmer Fredette briefly for a period of time, I have not, have not paid attention to them. I'm a Long Island guy myself, so I understand. Respect, respect. Uh, real quick, Dan, are you familiar with uh, Chad Thomas, who I believe plays for the Browns now in the NFL? 
Um, I'm not, but uh, maybe I will be refreshed as you keep going. It is, I'm from Miami. He played at the University of Miami. Um, basically, so his issue was in NCAA. He was battling eligibility his final year. Uh, he went to a performance arts high school, um, specialized in music, went to the University of Miami, and then began producing music while he was an athlete. Um, and then in sort of the summer between his final year, uh, rappers like Rick Ross and Drake came out and said he produced for them. And then the I have heard of them. I've heard right. of those. <laughs> right. So, you know, he's had great success and the NCAA came out and uh, tried to take his eligibility away and he fought it and continued to play. And basically what they came down with um, was in order for him to comply, um, his social channels could not mix the two. His likeness at UM had nothing to do with his likeness as, you know, Chad, the producer. Um, and then obviously, you know, he went with that and played. Now he's in the NFL. But I'm wondering, um, going forward, especially with the pressure the NCAA is facing now, do you think they're going to maybe soften these rules and all that? Um, I, first of all, I, I, don't, I don't think I was familiar with that beforehand, but I, I think that's a great point, similar to what, to what Jake, is, Jake Williams and um, um, Loyola had mentioned. Right? Why, you know, maybe you shouldn't be able to profit off your likeness as a athlete. Let's say you buy that argument. You producing music it doesn't seem to be that much of a nexus, right? You playing professional video games if you're LeBron James Jr.'s son, like, shouldn't have that much of a nexus. But in the social media world, everything is kind of connected, right? You know, LeBron James Jr., I'm sure, is not that good of a video game player where he's a professional video game player. He's getting it because he's LeBron James' son. I mean, just um, probably the nature of the beast. So, you know, I, I think, you know, and, and, and I mean, all, all great questions from the crowd. They're all kind of addressing the same point there are these external factors pushing on the NCA to force them to change. Uh, one by one, you know, I think after a hundred years of never paying players, right, they're agreeing to pay players, but they're very much dragging their heels. Um, so uh, I, I would think it would be in the NCA's interest to be very transparent, to say that we are, you know, uh, we, you know, when they, when they say in baseball, the tie goes to the runner, the tie goes to the athlete, but time and time again, tie goes to the university, the tie goes to Goliath. Um, and that's why, you know, someone like Tom Mars, um, you know, why we wanted to have him at least on the podcast, he speaks about his background. He's kind of being a version of a civil rights lawyer. He's fighting for this type of change. Um, now, I, I did want to mention this. I'm happy you brought up this point. Um, it's another little nugget, another potential note for someone to, to pick up on or someone to watch. Right now, right in the Big Ten, they're players as big as Justin Fields, right? Justin Fields, like every time I pop on Twitter, Justin Fields is trending because he's going to watch University of Georgia practices. Ohio State is not playing. Georgia is playing football. So in a world where player empowerment, right? And that's, that's I think, the topic everyone keeps putting at. Player empowerment is ripe in the pros, but it is slowly and truly making its way to college, which it should. It 100% should. If player empowerment were at college, Justin Fields, who hashtag we want to play, he could just switch jerseys, it's not that complicated, and go play for an SEC school. He could sign a waiver and all that fun stuff. Um, but that's not the way college football works. And that's why I asked Tom on the podcast, if you are aware, if you were involved, and, you know, I took a, you know, as they say, like a shooter's got to shoot. I asked him, he didn't have to answer it. But he said he is in the process of working uh, towards an NCAA hardship uh, privilege that's recognized specifically for uh, pandemic, similar act of God situations that are related to you know, maybe a version of Hurricane Katrina, uh, you know, um, any type of similar act of God that we're dealing with now. Um, so we're going to have a year, right, where these um, seniors in the Big Ten, right, that are trying to get draft ready. Um, Big Ten football is not going to go until the spring, at least until anything changes. So and the draft um, is going to occur prior to the conclusion of spring football, if that ever actually happens. Um, so these seniors now just lost their senior year, just poof, like it's gone. In a, in a fair world, in a player empowerment world, why wouldn't they be able to go to the ACC? Like, why wouldn't they be able to go to play for Notre Dame? Why couldn't there be a bidding war for their services, right? It doesn't really make sense. So I think these are the types of situations. Player empowerment is coming. It's a matter of the NCAA wants to deal with that or not. And that's why, again, I kind of alluded to it. The G League exists. It's an arm of the... And the NBA, um, the XFL, I think why The Rock made a fantastic investment in the XFL, that could be a version of the G League where if college football is canceled, right? The Rock, you know, they're professional athletes, right? They can sign these COVID-19 waivers. If 
The Rock wanted to, you know, have his inaugural draft tomorrow. Justin Fields would be the first pick and Justin Fields would be playing because by all indications, Justin Fields is never going to touch a college football again because he's going to be a very high pick in the draft. And there's no reason he would sign up for a Willis McGahee type situation and bust his knee or anything like that. He's going straight to the pros. So um, I think this XFL is that, that middle gap, um, you know, that, uh, well, maybe, uh, you know, another, another driving force to push player empowerment to its fullest extent um, in, college, in college sports generally. Yeah, I think I, I think I see a question from my colleague, um, at Goldberg Segala, David uh, Coppola. I'm pretty sure I see him raising his hand. He's definitely not on mute and uh, refusing to, to speak. I don't think I've baited him successfully. So Paige, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it back to you. He's, no he's not going to, not going to flinch. Do we um, have any last minute questions? Any, um, anyone want to jump in? Sure, I have one more completely unrelated to anything law. So um, why hasn't the NCAA ever asked the NFL to start funding them because they are a farm league? I missed the, I missed the first part. Why hasn't the NCAA ever kind of demanded of the NFL for some funding because they are essentially a farm league? I mean, I guess what the NFL would point out and if, I'm, if you ask me to wear the NFL attorney's hat, you know, the NCAA is demanding funding, right? When the players graduate, they could go wherever they want. And I'm going to say a large, the majority, lion's share, do not go to the NFL. They have careers like, you know, Paige is a, you know, Division One volleyball player, right? Division One. did I get that right, Paige? Yeah. Paige is not playing professional volleyball. She's pursuing her law degree. So there are a lot of people that will play football and do any number of things. So I think the top top guys will have that argument, but I don't, you know, if it was a true feeder system, like, you know, minor league baseball, where everyone was pushed towards the top. Um, but I think you have kind of freedom of choice to pick where you want to go. Obviously, sometimes that choice is made for you, but I think that would, if I'm the NFL's lawyer and we were having a conversation, um, I would probably, you know, uh, I know, I know that you were right in my heart of hearts, but I would say that out loud to pretend I was right. I guess because the NCAA, the uh, the NHL funds junior leagues, and we're talking not even major junior, like junior A leagues, where kids might not even play college hockey. So they give direct funding to them. So I'm just wondering, you know, whatever. Um, there's a an expression in the in the law, um, you know, sometimes. Uh, and David, who decided not to ask a question, even though I gave him a nice platform to do it, when we sign releases in our cases, we always say it's not an admission of guilt. It's just uh, this is a settlement, no admission of guilt. We just going our separate ways, here's some money. So I would, I would say in that, again, I, Jake, I tend to believe that you're right, but if I'm playing devil's advocate, great movie, by the way, devil's advocate, it's on Netflix. I'm not getting paid to say that, so it's just a very good movie. Um, I would say that's just gratuitous. And NHL makes a ton of money, and if they want to give some to juniors to help increase their product down the line, like power to them. Should the NFL do that? Probably, but again, probably under no legal obligation to do it. Even though I agree with you that they should be doing it. Well, if um, that was our last question, I, I think, Dan, um, we can probably wrap up. Uh, I know, like I mentioned before, these are ongoing fluid issues that are ever changing and um, I'm going to be keeping up with them. I know you're going to be keeping up with them. I'm going to be looking at sports law loss to kind of uh, keep my news uh, sources in check while I'm studying at the same time. So um, I, I just want to say thank you on behalf of Scalp. This was incredibly um, helpful for our knowledge into just the current events issues in the intersection sports and law right now. And we really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you very much. Just, uh, I guess, briefly, thank you to uh, Xavier Romero for uh, setting this up. Um, recent LLM graduate, much appreciated. Uh, and then uh, just a quick plug. Uh, for those that don't want to go on Twitter and deal with the badness, uh, I post the kind of the best of over on Instagram. Uh, and then, uh, you know, if you didn't, if you're not a social media person, once a week we do Conduct Detrimental with uh, uh, my fellow uh, podcast host, Dan Wallach, who's the betting of, uh, the guru of sports betting. He's, he's um, has a much bigger following than I do on Twitter. He's a another really just smart, uh, former appellate attorney and now is just 
sports betting super consultant. So he works with DraftKings, FanDuel, another really, really smart guy. Um, so yeah, Conduct Detrimental, we're on Spotify, Apple, all that fun stuff. Um, and then my, just as a final point, I'm an open book, as Jake can tell you, I answer probably all of my DMs for no reason. Um, but yeah, if you have a question, something came up late. Uh, if you're David Coppola and afraid, too afraid to ask a question in front of your uh, alma mater, um, you can just DM me, my DMs are always open. Thank you so much, Dan. We really look forward to keeping up with you. And um, also thank you guys for coming today. I hope everyone has a great Labor Day weekend and uh, stay safe. Thanks guys. Thank you, Paige. You did a great job, I appreciate it. Thank you. Bye, thank Cheers. you. Thanks. Hey. Hi, Dean Evans. Sorry, I think I was. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> great job. Yeah, it worked out very well. Yeah, thank you. He was he was great. I know he was he was very excited about. Um, oh wait, actually, I'm going to stop recording really.